I would like to share with you some observations and thoughts why I think medicine needs AI. And one of these needs comes from precision medicine. One of the main goals in precision medicine is that we characterize individual diseases as good as possible to find the best possible therapy for a given patient. In order to do this, we need lots of data coming from different measurements and instrumentations. It's classical clinical parameters, blood pressure, laboratory parameters, imaging in radiology, pathology. But we also learned we only can interpret these results properly when we know the individual genetic makeup. So we need sequencing data, and without knowing the impact of environment, we are lost. And all these together at the end defines an individual disease and gives us the rationale, the facts for selecting the right therapy. But even there, we have a huge complexity. Medicines, drugs, act differently in different patients depending, again, on the genetic makeup. And many patients need multiple medications. And these drugs interact with each other. And you can easily imagine all this information together is so enormous that humans are overwhelmed. And it's not easy anymore using this information properly and coming up with uh, decisions. So therefore, I think we need the help of technology. And the question is, what can I, I help us in this context? Now, we are using artificial intelligence in our daily life in various services, speech recognition, search engines, advertising, image recognition, translation, spam filters, and there are many more. Very often we are not aware that there is AI technology behind. But the question, what does this mean for medicine? When I discuss with my colleagues and friends on AI and medicine, they say artificial intelligence is not intelligent at all, and how can you ever imagine that a machine can replace a human? No, that's not the case. Of course, it's machine intelligent, and it's different. And this is not a weakness. Actually, it's a strength. It's because it should complement human cognitive capacities with machine intelligence. I give an example why this is important. This is an image of a tumor. It was operated, it was, the tumor was sectioned, was stained, and this is a digital image, and this is the basis to make a diagnosis. And if you show this image to a pathologist, it takes a second, and the pathologist will recognize this is a cancer, that's a colon cancer. And this diagnosis, it's correct, it's reproducible, and it's cheap. But there is much more information morphology, which we cannot use that way because it's too complex and it's not reproducible. And there is another limitation. When we ask the same people, please quantify how many tumor cells are there and how many non-tumor cells, because we need this information, for instance, because we have performed sequencing to find which mutation caused the tumor, which is important background information to find the proper therapy. Then you get the result, as you see in the right slide. This was an experiment we did actually in a context of a laboratory course for a molecular pathology. So we asked the participants, please quantify what is the percentage of tumor cells, because we need it to properly interpret the results from next generation sequencing. And what you can see, there were some people who said it's 70%, some people said seven, and the average of the group was 24%. Now the question is, who is right? And where does this variation come from? Actually, there's a good explanation. Humans are biased by visual illusion. Whatever we see, we only see in context of color, size, and shape. So we never see it individually. And therefore, we are always biased from the context in which we get visual information. Now, what can computers do? If we apply, for instance, an algorithm to analyze the tumor cell content, these algorithms can nicely recognize what is tumor, in yellow, what is non-tumor in green, and they also can uh, recognize individual nuclei. And once you have recognized them, you can count them, you can quantify them. And if you use the algorithm, the result is 58%. Now you remember the result of the experiment. So the apparent outlier was closest to reality. And the average of the group was more than twofold wrong. And I think this example shows you how humans can improve their skills by using technology. 
a prerequisite to use the power of computers is that we move from the classical diagnostic work flow with microscopes to a digital one. So we digitize the slide, but it's not just moving from a microscope to a screen, it's more, because once you're digital, you can distribute the files, you can send it to specialists elsewhere in the world, so you're not limited anymore to your local experts, but even more importantly, you can use algorithms, help you to analyzing uh, the features. And why this is important, I show in another example. If you look about the global situation of pathology service, please be aware, for instance, if you have a tumor, a pathological diagnosis is still the most important information to find the proper therapy. In the US, we have about 17,000, or one pathologist per 17,000 people. This situation, by the way, will decrease in the near future because there are more pathologists retiring in the next year than are in your education. And this is in a situation where we have an increased workload because of aging population, but also because of the increased requirements of precision medicine. Also, it's in a pretty good situation, but the other parts in the world, like we in India, you have one pathologist for 65,000. China, one, there are about 90,000. And there are countries in Africa where you have one pathologist for more than 9 million people. You can easily imagine if a person develops a tumor in this country, they will not get the proper diagnosis. And without the proper diagnosis, no proper therapy, even if medication is available. So one way to uh, overcome or reduce this situation is outsourcing workflows. And there are examples, networks. So you can digitize a tumor in Africa or elsewhere, send it to US or Europe and ask for a diagnosis by a specialist. This works in principle. You see these networks are existing. But please be aware, there is no chance that US or Europe can talk over the diagnostic workload for the rest of the world. And also our current education systems can never compensate this deficit in the near future. So we need technology. We need other solutions. And now here, the question is, can AI help? And can this be, this technology? And I'll give you one example of what we may expect from AI in the near future. This result from a study performed on a public data set that was made available in the context of a competition. And this data set contained histological images from lymph node metastases from patients that had breast cancer. And the task was to find an algorithm that is able to recognize a metastasis in a lymph node. And in order to train algorithms, these images were classified, were annotated by experienced pathologists marking where is tumor, where is non-tumor. This was used to train algorithms, a couple of hundreds of these data sets, and then algorithms were able to recognize the tumor, as you see in the upper right. Uh, in the red area, you see where the algorithm predicts serious metastasis. On the left, you see the section. And actually, it was correct, and it was even able to recognize very similar alterations in, this, uh, in the slide. So this example, where algorithms that are trained by experts at the end, before similar, or even better than the trainer, is now shown in different diseases in different organs. So it's very reproducible. But there are limitations. As I showed you, the training of this algorithm requires people who exactly mark where is a tumor, where is a non-tumor. This is, of course, quite laborious, expensive, and also it's limiting. Because we can quite well reproduce a diagnosis, but we are not used to reproduce the recognition of individual cells. Um, so it's fully reproducible. And it's restricted to what we know. But there's so much more information we could never capture, so we can never capture the full power of technology if we limit the approach to what we know. And there's another aspect. It's not just the explicit knowledge that we use making decisions. What we say, for instance, this is a tumor cell, this is not a tumor cell. No, it's the experience behind. Why do we say this is a tumor cell? And why do we say this is not a tumor cell? So this cannot be used at the moment. So the question is, is there another opportunity? And that's actually it's what we call weekly supervised learning. What does it mean? In this case, of course, we also need training data, images, 
with tumors. But in this case, we do not train the algorithm by telling exactly this was the tumor, this was the benign, the malignant cell. No, we just tell this tumor had a very good outcome. The patient survived 10 years longer, but this was a tumor where the patient died a few years after surgery. And let the algorithm find which feature, which element in this image information had the strongest correlation with the outcome. And it works. The only difference to the previous approach is you need much more data. You're not talking about hundreds of data sets, we are talking of many thousands of data sets. Now, the additional opportunity is if you train an algorithm like this and you can trace back which feature in your complex information was strongly correlated with the outcome or response to therapy, you can go back to the original tumor and look why did this area correlate or influence so, so strongly the outcome? You can look whether certain mutations, was there certain immune response to the tumor? Are there possible new biomarkers? Or can we redefine our diagnostic skills? So it has major implications. Now, as I said, in order to exploit the opportunity of this type of training algorithms, we need massive data. And I think that's uh, an example why we need biobanks. Biobanks are collections where we have millions of these type of images linked with medical data, outcome data. So now we retrieve this information, make it accessible to train, train algorithm. So we may expect major advancement of the field in the next few years. Now the question is, what's next? So I think the technology essentially is there. Proof of concept has been shown. Data can be made available, particularly through biobanks. But one of the big questions is, how can we assure that the prediction made by an algorithm is reliable so that a medical doctor can take the responsibility? So we have to make it explainable. So we have to make clear what were the most important parameters influencing the prediction. At the moment, we are still mainly in the research domain. There are many approaches and solutions from many organizations, universities, startups, all coming up with very smart but different solutions. That's not the future. For using it in healthcare, we need standardized and harmonized procedures. And also at the end, we have to be aware, we use it in a medical context, so it has to fulfill the requirements we otherwise find in diagnostic applications. And there is another aspect. Here we are talking about very fancy technology. But there is a global need, and we should be very careful that the benefit and access to technology is not limited to some very rich developed countries. We have to really think about how this technology can help all countries in the world, and we do not create a new level of inequality to access to healthcare. And finally, we are facing here a real change management issue. Digital pathology and AI medicine is disruptive innovation. Most medical doctors have never learned this technology. They're used with their procedures uh, learned and trained over a year. They know their family. They, they, they're used to take responsibility. They know the limitations. Now they get a new technology. They have never learned the background. It's a more than a huge black box for them. Now they should use it. Um, and of course, many people are scared. And still there is the undermining um, concern that the computer will replace the human. And hopefully, with the few examples I shared, you can show this is not the application of AI in medicine. It's about complementing human capacities with machine capacities to help patients. Thank you.